It's all screwed up out there, man. But you don't need me to tell you that. You already know. Welcome to Deep Americana. Hello, I'm Ray Carney. Today, I'll be interviewing Adriel over immigration. What's happening with the immigration reform that we have going on in America today. And what it's like to help another person out. With that, Adriel, um, do you want to talk about your life? Sure. Uh, again, thanks for inviting me, Ari. Not a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, wh where does one begin? Um, I think uh, maybe the pandemic is um, a relatable starting point. Yeah. Um, uh, personally, um, it's... Uh, you know, there's, uh, I think, a Kierkegaard quote, which um, I'm, ne I'm never good with uh, uh, memorizing too many quotes, but uh, there's a quote about how when he realized that uh, what people call charity, what people call sincerity, virtue, he sort of looked at that and he laughed because it was the, the things that people think mean those things is kind of funny. So... As someone who has, um, um, I think we, we mentioned off there before how I've actually lived on the streets for a while in New York, yeah. and for someone that has been essentially alienated to such an extent as not only the poor, but obviously anyone living in the gutter, literally on the streets, is, you have every... Uh, shred of dignity deprived from you, essentially. Um, and there's no, uh, there is no genuine, sincere outreach to fix the uh, situation that creates homelessness and poverty. So, uh, someone who has lived through that kind of deprivation, I sort of see this wildly fascinating situation with this pandemic where many people are afraid um, of their lost income. Many people are terrified at what it would mean for months on end right. if their economic uh, structure, what they depend on, which is usually uh, not very much because so many of us in the States are, uh, we've been made to sort of exist in a kind of desperate search for the next gig, the next job, never with any more assurance than the next paycheck or two. Uh, everyone is just going around terrified, by the way, legitimately. I mean, you know, they're completely right to be terrified. But the concerns um, that I hear in the news and that people are expressing, uh, you know, sort of a, imagine just taking the most, you know, uh, basic of social distancing, stay home, uh, a social uh, spaces are shut down, you know, you have to stay away from people, and there's this feeling that people have communicated that it's unhealthy to be so alienated. You don't want to remain indoors, or as, you know, usually it's expressed, they don't want to remain away from people, and again, moments like that, I just kind of like, because of course you, you can understand someone who is driven to the gutter of society, someone who is deprived of, it, of any dignity, any ab ability to gain income, this is exactly their life experience. It's, right. it's living apart from people and having a, a huge swath of the world denied to you. So I, I, I hear people's genuine concerns and it's sort of like, I think I know I think I know what that's like, you know? Right. And it's sad. It's sad. Um, but I I sort of, um, it's sad and bleak in a way, but it's sort of like, you know, some of us have been there. Well, it's kind of, kind of like it's been, like it's leveling the playing yeah. field in a way. So I think people are going to kind of feel that and, and possibly yeah. be able to understand that way of life a little more. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, no problem. This is we're talking, so we'll step on each other sometimes. There's no problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I actually, you know, I'm not a, a 
person this exactly. Um, I, I tend to be what they call a positive pessimist, which is someone who sort of sees reality in its real way, which is you know usually not so romantic, but quite quite drab sometimes and very sober. Um, and I, I just go on. I hope fighting the good fight despite a bleak reality because you know you gotta do the right thing regardless but i i don't sadly i i don't think that too many of us will learn the lessons from the latest uh awful thing that happens i mean if some of us have already learned it um and we were not listened to generally and other people have also learned just by observing others suffer, which is nice. But as a structure, I mean, if you're of a certain age, uh, if you are someone in your 70s or 80s, or you are, let's say, an older millennial born in the early 80s, um, as I am, you've been through a few catastrophes, right? You've been through, um, again, depending when you sort of came into consciousness uh, as a human being, you might remember Y2K that was supposed to end something, and it was kind of a joke and nothing happened. Okay, we made it to the year 2000. Then there's, you know, any number of financial collapses, you know, the most meaningful one, obviously the Great Recession, 07, 08. That was an opportunity also to sort of see some things and maybe address them, but no, we go on as usual. Right. Uh, perhaps torture, <laughs> you know, right, people torturing yeah. people. Uh, perhaps that was a moment to sort of see we have to no, not that one either. And right. we go on uh, a few more times. Yeah. Uh, so in a way, human beings, we have this amazing capacity to adapt to every assault the universe throws at us, even when we are actually throwing them at ourselves. <laughs> we kind of adapt to it and we go on, and this is not a bad thing because we do need to go on, right? And we cannot go on, you know, uh, harboring every detail uh, of every awful thing that has ever happened. We would not be able to go on. But, but on the other hand, some things should seep in there and teach us something, uh, teach us something in the way of doing something better. So I, I have a little book that we'll learn this time either, <laughs> but I am always so happy to be proven wrong. So. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. No doubt on, on that. I, I would say to go back into what you're talking about there, I, I think actually all of us people that are afraid of not having our nine to five or having a job could actually look to how homeless people actually live just on conserving things. Uh, and yes. it's, you know, I have, I have, yeah, I have uh, had that conversation with a few people. I imagine. Um, again, I, I, yeah, obviously, absolutely. We need to, um, they need to have it with us and we need to have it with them. Absolutely. I am not someone, there are some people who can be very, uh, they get very angry again, right. for good reason right, at, right. at the abuse that they have been made to feel uh, yeah. in the world, and they kind of flip the finger to anyone that, you know, to all the people now that are feeling very uh, vulnerable. I know some people that are still living on the street um, or that themselves got off, and they're a little, they're a little angry, and they go, yeah, well, now you know what it feels like. I'm not so interested in that. I'm Right. I'm just very happy to, I'm very happy to, um, to maybe, yeah, to say some of us know what that feels like. Right. And isn't it awful that there's a space in society where it's acceptable that a cast of society is relegated to this. Right. What you're going through right now, sir or ma'am, with your loss of income, your vulnerability to the economy, through no fault of your own, some of us have literally been relegated to that cast. Isn't that awful? And let's talk about that. That's kind of my attitude. Yeah. But um, I've had this conversation with people where I, I try to essentially, because again, those of us who have been through our own form of deprivation, uh, we have sort of gone into, what is that? Something happens when you expect something and because you expect it or you've been through it, your reaction is a little more restrained, uh, more calm. Right. So I've tried to tell people, you know, given all things, it's, it's not as bad as it can be. You still 
have an apartment, you still have a right. place, luckily your job is still there even though it's being ridiculous, etc. Right. It's right. not too much of a consolation to them, but I right. have tried to do that. Uh, there's a, a book that I'm going to begin reading, I haven't read. Um, it's a book about poverty in America, and um, it's called, I think, uh, $2 a day, or living on $2 a day, mm-hmm. and it's basically about the, the most extreme uh, 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 communities in America where this is what they've been relegated to. It's, it's a kind of extreme poverty, which generally you don't associate with American cities. You imagine that it's these kinds of situations are you know, uh, otherworldly and, and, and other nations, but not here. So, yeah, I mean, we got to talk to each other, and I certainly try. I don't know that it's getting through too much, though, but I'll see. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I would hope we we're turning a, a corner, hopefully, during this pandemic, uh, you know, as to how we feel about each other and as to how yeah. we react towards each other. Understand this is about community. The reason this Absolutely. has happened is there is no community. <laughs> you know what I mean? There, like, there is togetherness right. in pockets. But the overall, you know, governing governing and, and currency and things of that nature are not about community right now. And that's that's why we're we have a pandemic. I mean it would have probably been there to begin with, but you know, if the other things could happen. So yeah. uh, Adriel, let me ask you, uh well how do you feel about immigration? Um well talk to yeah, you about that's that. That's a loaded question, right? Uh, I yeah, know, I know. Um, Oh, no, no, yeah, that's like, you know, asking a Jew, how do you feel about anti-Semitism? <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Yes, uh, immigration. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah, so much like um, my own experience living on the streets and, as I said, being uh, caught up in a, in a space of deprivation that is very uniquely reserved for mm-hmm. a bunch of people and we move on with... I said, that's okay. Uh, immigration, uh, I mean, so most of my life I've sort of lived in thought, um, meaning that I try to engage ideas. Right. Um, I, am much, I am much more interested in, uh, you know, obnoxious terms like existentialism, um, uh, philosophy, uh, great literature and what it can teach me to live life. I've not spent much time, most of my life, into thinking about me as an immigrant right. or me as someone who lives in a certain corner in you know New York City. It's, there are bigger things that are much more interesting, even right. though, of course, these things are, you know, even though all of those things are part of who I am, my goodness, they are, in reality, to me, among the least interesting parts of me, right? Right, right. But in a, in a, in a time of, uh, again, you know, I, I know that pe- different people use different language, but, right. I mean, in a time, in a time, as I would term it, of rabid white nationalism, right. where the, the parsed uh, uh, dog whistles of old conservative um, rhetoric uh, that was already known to be pitched at a certain white resentment, uh, where that was the way of the world before, clearly some conservative minds or white nationalist minds have looked at that trajectory of the dog whistle and, and woke up in 2008 and saw that a black man was elected. So clearly the dog whistle wasn't working, so we need a bullhorn with right. someone like the man in the White House now. Hey. And so my my state of being that is marginally important to me, right. my my, yeah. my being my being an immigrant, uh, my you know, whatever, that becomes something that, you know, even though to me I recognize it as one aspect to these people. It's the most important thing about me. Uh, so how I feel about it all is, again, as I said, it's, I feel about it like uh, as, uh, as I imagine a Jew would have felt in Germany. Uh, they, if, if you read um, the very robust, uh, incredibly fascinating and, and intelligent uh, literature of, of German Jewry, in the early 20th century, uh, century they were very, uh, before, um, you know, the, the war, they were very concerned about what it meant to be a Jew 
abroad, outside of a homeland, and what it meant to be a Jew in Germany. And there was a great conversation about, can we be Jews in Germany? Um, is that okay? Is that good? What does it mean to be a Jew in Germany? Should we be hyper-German to prove that a Jew can be, you know, as German as the rest of them? And it was a great, um, as, as usual, Jewish conversations are, uh, in literature, are just the best. Um, uh, uh -huh. You know, I sympathize with a mind that wants to talk and, and understand and bicker. I really do. Yeah. So I'm saying that's kind of how I feel right now. It's sort of like um, you think you're a human being, Uh, as an immigrant, and if you're like me, you came here as a child, perfectly legally, still am a you know, legal immigrant. Right, I, am right. not, uh, I am not, um, I, there are uh, immigrants in other situations where they came, they were brought as children, um, illegally, through no fault of their own, right. who should totally be understood as part of the American fabric, but they're like adopted children, um, and, and we're tossing them around for political But right, uh, right. yeah, I kind of feel like I kind of feel like that. Like um, I'm pretty damn sure uh, that immigrants like me and other immigrants on the spectrum of um, uh, either citizenry or, or non non citizens are as much of a part of the fabric and as invested in the American project as anyone else. But um, these people think otherwise. So all of a sudden, obnoxiously, I would say for me, I am. <laughs> In, in a moment where I need to project my, my, uh, my, my immigrant being, mm -hmm. um, you know, because otherwise what's going on is erasure or, um, you know, demonization. Um, yes. You know, so that's where I'm at. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> hey, that's, yeah. you, you know, and that, that's something that, And I apologize if I was offensive in any way there, but I'll, I'll say that we're... Not at all. Th no this way, whole, not at all. Th this, whole, this whole country is built on the backs of immigrants. And so, yeah. like, they're... And, and, and that's that's the thing, is that this country, that's what makes this place, is this melting pot. And there is right. a ton of white nationalist stuff. I, I, I'm in hopes that, like, this influx of, of ethnocentrism, you know, of any of these isms that have flared out of control in the past four years or what have you, is kind of like a dying animal. <laughs> and when, when something's yeah. dying, it lashes out. And I'm, I'm, you know, that's me being super positive, hoping that we can actually understand this. Because you know what? I, you know, myself, I've been in foster care as, as well. I've been in crazy, at six, I lived in the Salvation Army, you know, crazy situations. Wow. And um, yeah. I'm a white guy, so I don't experience, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the extent You know, um, but I have seen, you know, kid, kids shouldn't have to be raised this way, regardless. It, it put in cages, yeah. so on and so forth. It, it's it's asinine and it's just, it's ridiculous. You're causing PTSD. I could go on. You're causing so many problems. Yeah. And then I, I think in, yeah. in our, our country, possibly, you know, look, look at how we ha have people immigrate in or, or what have you. You know, I don't think building a wall, that's the funny thing about people that are orange that want to build a wall is that, well, th <laughs> think, think about this, you know, like the, the drugs and things of, of that nature, a lot of that shit is coming over, not even coming over that wall. It's going under it in a fucking tunnel. What is a wall going to do that tunnel? And I'll tell you what, um, our governments know this, right? Yeah. It, and, it, it's just, and that's not conspiracy. That's a real thing. And it's like, what are we really yeah. doing? We're keeping poor people away. We're letting the motherfuckers that have money have a tunnel. And it's just, it is ridiculous. Anyways, yes, I, I had to rant a little bit there. But yeah, man, it's, yeah. We, we need to be accepting of each other. So, uh, how does it make you feel to help other people? Obviously, you know, the net benefit of um, helping other people is that because we are social beings, we are greatly affected positively by, you know, helping anyone else. Um, it's, uh, I think there's been, I mean, if one wants to be scientific about it, there's been scientific um, 
uh, studies where the effects of, quote, being good or being positive towards other people is actually good for you. Yes, uh, yes. Specifically, health-wise, it's good for you. Uh, but ultimately, that's how our species ever got anywhere, is by recognizing that, in fact, we are not each other's enemies, but we need to come together with all right. the bickering that that includes, we need to come together to build things, yeah. build ideas, build yeah. better better schools, build better roads. We cannot do it with a narrow section pounding on its chest, thinking right. that it's the best. <laughs> you know, right, whatever. right, right. No, we, we, it, it, is, it boils down to like helping in community. It's like, you know, like in a community, people are doing their parts to help each other. And I think we've lost that. I think this uh, coronavirus thing uh, has shown that we've lost that. Like, we are more interested in profit, you know, than, than anything yeah. else. You know, than anything else. And we've got to try to get that back. We've got to, to give a shit. We have to give a shit. Let's put that on a, on a t-shirt. I'm <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, absolutely, I mean... Um... I mean, not to go in it into it too deep at all, but That's okay. there's there's um, a way to look at this in specific. These ideas about us and them, and these people are taking something from us, and we need to hoard what we have, and we need to deny it to them. It's uh, both an illusion. But it's also a manufactured reality by a lot of forces. So right. we do live in a world, it's not even a country, we live in a world that has built itself upon a certain economy that makes you feel, makes the individual feel that there's not really much. And we're going to give you some ability to gain some coins, to get some things, but you're always going to be desperate about the next batch of coins. So you, the individual, are made to feel like, well, we don't have that many coins to go around. So these other people, sometimes it's women, sometimes it's you know people of color, sometimes it's immigrants, sometimes it's other poor people. Right. You're told, you, the desperate individual that is getting some coins, we don't have many to go around, so you've got to make sure those other people cannot get those coins too because there's just not many to go around. And this is a reality that we've manufactured. So in a way, the average worker, let's say the, the average alienated white individual who is struggling him or herself is not imagining that there is something wrong with their economy. But it, it is always unfortunate when you see that the people who are actually in power, who tend to be of a certain power structure and white hue, they are the oh, yeah. ones making a structure that indeed alienates uh, poor white people and then tells them it's not us, let's say, white people in suits of a higher economy that are making it this way. No, no, it's, it's the other people uh, beside you. It's the people that are struggling even more than you are. You need to make sure that you beat them on the head. It's so sad, you know, especially to end my little, my own little rant here. When I, it's really heartbreaking to me because, uh, you know, it is a fact that, a fact that you'll never hear <laughs> to, uh, often enough, but an immigrant laborer or a poor non-white worker who is struggling from gig to gig has a lot in common with the white, disaffected, poor white person. But we, we cannot see that similarity in struggle because other people are invested in making sure that we keep fighting each other. Right. It's so heartbreaking. Right. It's so heartbreaking. Um, but yeah, that, that's the end of my little rant there. So that's, it's awful. Well, there, like, you know, there's... Uh... I'll, try, I'll tie this in. There's a, a myriad of examples of this. What Adriel just, just said might sound kind of like a conspiracy theory. It's, it's not. You can go back. You can go back throughout our history. Like everything we consume, let me give you a really good example uh, for our listeners. Yeah. Everything we consume, ha consume through buying, eating, that has a brand on it or what have you, right, is propaganda, quite literally. 
all the brand names you consume, period. And so right there, we're controlling people through these things, through these uh, brands, right? Which comes down to also, you know, your, your like electronic drugs. I'll skip into that, um, which is your yeah. cell phone when you're hitting dopamine with social media, like with every like. Um, and so right. we are definitely able to control how people's minds, uh, not, you know, I, I don't, it's not uh, some magic type thing. And you're not, you know, you're, you're controlling people's uh, perception and a lot of their decision uh, making as to what to buy and what to do through a lot of this media. And that is, you know, everything from corporations to governments, which are the corporations, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a very real thing. I think Charles Barkley had said it best that, I'm not going to remember the quote, but he was like, you know, you guys should, I completely forgot what I was going to say. That's terrible. Well, please edit that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was something no, no, to, the, okay. to the effect yeah. of, you, you know, your, your, the, these divisions... And it's not, it's not just, you know, poor people, it's middle class, it's all the way up. We're getting breastfed information. Um, and the more things we can find, so essentially what racism uh, and all the other isms are, uh, in my view from like looking at this stuff is, it is the simplest way I can put it, is the, the point in which you don't want to learn about something and you find a negative negative connotation to yeah. assign to that. And then what happens after that is the way, and I'll, I'll tell you guys right now how you can unite people, and it's the worst way you can possibly do it. But we, we see this in times of war all the time, is you, you come out with a stone, you give another person a stone, and that doesn't quite unite them. But you give them a target, and then they're united. And that's a real yeah. negative approach of that. But that's what we see with a lot of this propaganda like, especially if you go into war times, things of that nature. And I'll guarantee you right now, you know, people have noticed how people react to that propaganda and what happens after that. So why not use that, you know, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. No, language, language, language games, what, what is absolutely propaganda and brand advertising or marketing. constant. It's all yeah. marketing, every bit of it. Yes, yes, the, the uh, manufacturing of an urge that you must get something else, something mm -hmm. more. The old saying that six months old is somehow not good enough now. Right. Well, all of that is, there's no magic involved. We are susceptible to language. Um, right, right. Absolutely. Right. It, yeah, definitely not magic. Just like realization, you know, I, I think. Uh, yeah. And I'm really can't emphasize marketing enough. It's used on all facets of our society at every level. Does that mean it's always bad? No. You know what I mean? But I, I think yeah. the majority of us, including myself and everybody, has, has you, know, you know bought into certain things. Um, but it, it comes to points, I, th I think, uh, of questioning things, you know, lo looking around really experiencing your environment, your reality. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that when I was a teenager, um, for, for no specific reason, it was, to my understanding, chance and luck. I, um, I sort of, uh, I was kind of a religious person. As, as a kid, you're a child, you inherit the religion of your parents or right. your, your community. Yeah. But then I sort of began to take a very strong interest in it to understand it. And once I did that, and it was genuine and sincere, uh, it took me on essentially, you know, from about the age of 14 through 18, 19, a journey of learning that ultimately ended in me being, you know, a secular individual. Um, but once you peer the, the, the layer of one huge deception, you know, like some I, I would say that religion, mysticism, is a kind of deception. Once you peel back that layer and you go, wow, everyone believes it, and it's, it doesn't seem to be, quote, true, you think, well, why wouldn't people believe in nationalism? Why wouldn't people believe in racism? Certainly, 
nationalism and racism or all the other isms, as you said, mm-hmm. they're less of a lie than mysticism, <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm just, I feel very lucky that I am, um, I got on a path of um, sober attacking of ideas that was very unsentimental and whatever other um, struggles I have to go through, the struggle of investing in, in myths, whether it's race or, you know, uh, uh, toxic masculinity, I'm glad that I, I can do away with those a little bit. You right. Know? No, that's, that's, a, that's a, it's, it's good. I mean, it's, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's really good. I want to point this out. Yeah. Um, yeah, because there are about everything we're talking about. There are a ton of arguments about anything in today's day and age, right? Day and age. Yeah. Um, and the purpose of an argument is to learn, <laughs> and and I, I I think that's that's a, a very crucial element here that we're really not you and me, but in our yeah. culture we're missing. If you look at politics right now. You know, people in the same damn party can't even get along. You know what I mean? And like, and it, it's this argument. And I think we've completely lost the idea of what an argument is for. You know, even if even if I'm around somebody and I don't like their ideals, I can stomach it and talk to them for a little bit. You know, um, yeah, it, probably until it gets to to certain points, but. You know, I, I try not to just shut people up. If that makes sense, it's okay to shut people out as well. Yes. No, I am just like you there. I, I again, I think I learn yeah. from people that I am uh, in, in aggressive disagreement with. If not, uh, perhaps, as I'm always open, that they may understand something that I don't. Right. Or, that, or they may make an argument that I didn't realize was part of the argument. But also, if for nothing else, you do learn what the other person's thinking or what the other side is it's looking at as true and valid and beautiful and that can inform your own understanding and, and sure. that, yeah and, and that may that may very well turn out more unexpected than you think and you might be able to bring them across to your idea or have them understand that you know absolutely yeah well uh, Adriel do you have anything else you'd like to add um well, Ray, first, thank you for providing a space no for problem. different people of, of different kinds to to talk and hang out and bicker or, or share. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not a small thing, Ray, and uh, we need to do a lot more of it. So I'm just glad that, you know, any of us are, are, are speaking to each other, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's a very good thing. So with, with that, we are out. Hang on the line with me. This concludes my interview with Adriel. Thank you.